So we installed the old 8750 Predator generator in our permanent house, permanently connected to our power panel in the house. Five years ago, 2017, you can see the video here where I talk about the, the generator house that I built for it and how it's all situated. We used it for the first time last week uh, in five years. And while I was sitting there with the power on, I was thinking about, from the generator, I was thinking about the sensitive electronics and how the old Predator, the, the normal portable generators are really more for emergency backup, like running fridges and you know doing running saws or table saws or whatever. And not really for sensitive electronics like TVs and computers and like our Starlink internet and things like that. So I started to do some research and I see, and I found out this Predator 8750 inverter generators. They've got a, a 9,000 watt inverter generator that's fully enclosed. And then they have this open frame 8750 inverter generator. And I decided, well, it's the same size, got the same, pretty much can be plug and play. I might have to do little mods to the inside of the, the, the shed, but I'll be able to plug and play and use it for our whole house generator. So yesterday, Saturday, went ran and not ran down and grabbed this from the uh, nearest Harbor Freight. With another ice storm coming here this week, I didn't want to be without. I wanted to get this one in before this new ice storm came. So we're gonna open it up, get some oil into it, and get some gas into it, break it in a little bit, and then we'll work to install this before the storm comes on Tuesday or Wednesday this week. So let's get this baby opened up. That's it. It's um comes with a wheel kit and then a handle. I don't know if I'm going to install the wheel kit. I don't think I'm going to. Mainly because I've got the generator shed and I don't need to have it movable. I mean I I want to bolt the screw it down to the floor and I see that there's a couple screw holes, there's one right here. The rest of the screws in into the floor so that it stays still. If I have the wheel kit on it, then I can move it around, but I don't know if I really want that. Before we put any fuel in it, they want you to remove these brackets from the underside of the generator. They call them shipping brackets, these orange ones. Manual calls them gray, but so it took me a little bit to figure it out. We got to flip it upside down. And then you can remove them. 10 millimeter on the bolt head, 13 millimeter on the nut. So the, they ship a funnel because the oil fill is behind the panel. They send a funnel with a hose on it. It's got a little kink in it, so it might be troublesome, but um, should be able to get it in there. may want to provide your own vinyl hose, but manual calls for 1.1 quarts, 10W30 over 30 degree, 32 degrees, so I'm using Traveler 10W30, full synthetic. 26 ounces this first round. Overall, we'll put about 35 ounces in. It comes with a lithium battery. I don't know how that'll perform in the cold, so we'll see might end up upgrading to a lead cell, a lead acid. All right, here we go. First fire up. Choke. Make sure my electronic control throttle is off. Comes with Full house hookup, little guys, little guys, breakers, DC plugs, choke. So here we go. Pull the choke out, start. 
Maybe I gotta turn the fuel on. Yeah, that would help. to get a little bit longer vent pipe for the exhaust. I'd like the generator to be out here somewhere. This side is flexible. I think yeah, looking at it, I need to bring it up about an inch and a half. Easy enough. We'll put a 2x4 underneath it. Go get Longer class B vent pipe and should be good to go. So I went and got an extension on my for my class B vent pipe. 18 oh it's a, I think the six to twelve or eighteen inch extension. I didn't need a three footer, I just needed this little extension. So we'll close that way. So we'll slide that thing in. I think it's time to anchor the generator down. Find its spot that I want it. I also put two by fours underneath it to get it up a little bit, so that the exhaust is in line with my pipe output. output. So I screwed the generated to my two by fours. So I'm just gonna get it situated, lined up with the pipe on the right, left to right, get it kind of squared in here. I think I like it right about there. And then we'll fasten the two by fours down using the T25 bit and the construction screws I have. That's in. There, solid. Now we'll get the exhaust pipe installed. All right, so we have the exhaust hooked up on the right side. Get the intake left hooked up on the left side. Here, I'll get you in there. And all that's on that exhaust is just three self-tapping screws on the end of that pipe, screwed into the box for the exhaust. I also lengthened the cord, the wire coming out of the box here, so that in case we need to move it in the future. The last one was just just long enough because it was over here. It was actually right here. I had to move it over a little bit, but I made it a little longer in case we needed to move it. Last thing you need to do is hook up power cables for the six inch inline duct. 
and the exhaust attic fan. Do that here. And that's it. It's good to go, ready to run. So what I'm gonna do is get it started and then we'll go test it in the house, make sure everything's working to go, ready to go. So start it, left side, make sure fuel is on, that it is. Pull the choke out, make sure the electronic control throttle is off, which it is, and we start. Exhaust is coming out here, so that should minimize any carbon monoxide buildup inside, I hope. Otherwise, we might be playing around that CO monitor. I know there's some workarounds with that. We're running a test. Well pump. Fans running, that's good. Exhaust, still running. That's a good test. You can see I, I went and switched up everything back in the basement. Back to shore power. And electronic kick throttle kicked back down to low output. But so far it's working good. I'll run it for maybe another hour and see if we have any issues with the carbon monoxide detector. And then, uh, which is a safety mechanism on the on the generator, but I don't know if I need it in that shed. So I'm never gonna be in there with it. And when I'm in there, I'll have the doors open. So I also have the Predator 3500 for the RV and the little LCD screen for output and such is a lot more intuitive on 3500. This one, not so much. There's two screens that has some random letters and numbers on. I'm not really sure what they mean. And then one screen that's the hours on the unit. And then another the screen right after that, I think is the run time of that current uh, operating time. You know, if you start it, how long it's been running. Uh, so far, it's so, so good. Uh, it looks really, it looks like it's gonna work for us. What's nice with this setup I got in this generator shed is, you got the cold air intake coming in on the left, and then on the back side is where the hot air comes off the engine, and it's blowing right towards that attic fan. So the hot air is, is going out of the unit really quick, right to that into that attic fan and outside right away. So that's, that's nice that, uh, I guess happens. It's kind of lucky that that happened that way, uh, but it, it's working out good. So, otherwise, I'm happy with this. It's going to be better, more peace of mind for our electronics in the house if we ever lose power again, and making sure that we don't blow anything up when we're uh, using the sensitive electronics with the generator. So, thanks for watching. Have a good one. Bye.